Welcome to the combustion webinar. And uh, so this is the uh, uh, Tech on Fang from uh, NC State. And uh, today is our great pleasure to introduce actually my colleague, Dr. Uh, Taraki Shaki. And uh, he gave us a, a seminar on, on turbulence. And uh, Dr. Ishaki is the professor in our department and uh, since 2002. So he got his PhD from Stanford in 93. And then he did some uh, postdocs and research positions at, uh, you know, branch Jordan Institute and Sandia and also UC Berkeley. And uh, Professor Ishak is research mostly on combustion theory and turbulent combustion modeling. And his most recent work focused on development of multi-scale and database, database, database modeling, database modeling frameworks to overcome like challenges in turbulent combustion closure and to accelerate the simulation of turbulent reacting flows. And uh, Professor Ishaki is a fellow of uh, ASME and a associate fellow of uh, AIAA. And uh, so he's a co-editor uh, of a book, uh, Turbulent Combustion Modeling. And uh, I think uh, a lot of people working in the, in the modeling part will, will, will already read this book. And he also served as associate editor for ASME Journal of Heat Transfer. So with that, let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Shaki. It was an exciting talk. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Shaki. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tigang. I'll uh, go ahead and share my screen. Yeah. And uh, well, thank you, Tigang, again. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, the uh, the organizing organizing committee, uh, Wenting, Yiguang, uh, uh, Isaac. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, I'm sure it's early for some of you and it's very late for some of you and, and, and you may have other things to do on a Saturday morning, even if it's not late or early. Uh, so thank you very much. I, normally what I do is when I present the talk, I kind of go through my title a little bit. Um, and, and you could see here what I highlighted uh, are keywords here, database, traditional paradigms and data science. Uh, I could have used the word data driven, but it scares me a little bit. Um, you know, for a simple reason that uh, when we do modeling, we actually, especially in turbulent combustion, we're very deliberate. We we choose we choose to implement closure based on what we know about the physics. So, so I'd like to be uh, kind of you. I'd like to use the word data based as data as a helper, not as something that is basically an active verb like driven, where the data is is basically you know, uh, dictating what we're gonna do. Uh, so so that's, that's the key thing here, data-based. Um, everything has to rest on what we know about combustion, okay? I'm, 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 I'm really, I think, all for the use of data science and machine learning tools, but essentially they have to kind of, you know, follow our understanding, our deep understanding of what we have learned over the years since the 1940s, uh, you know, on, on how we approach the combustion model. But at the same time, we also are entering an era where we have data, data coming in from uh, well-resolved experiments, data coming in from LES, from DNS, from all kinds of sources. And, and, and that data can actually be used beyond the validation stage. So that's the key thing. Uh, this is not only my work, um, I'll have to recognize the work of my PhD students, uh, Ope Oyele, who is currently at LSU, uh, Hisam Murgobabai. Uh, they, they basically really, uh, they are the ones who kind of set the stage for this whole idea of um, you know, what we have been working on, which is principal component transport. And then also I have uh, Rishi, Rishikesh Vanadi, uh, Dr. Vanadi uh, has been really instrumental in the work on experimental, experiment-based determinant combustion modeling. And also in, in, uh, in providing the ideas for the depot net, uh, network that I'll be discussing briefly. And then, of course, I have also a current student, Kevin Gitushi, uh, who's also working on the area also of experiment based uh, turbulent combustion modeling. So, this is more or less an outline of what I would like to discuss. First of all, why do we have to worry about uh, closure? In what role data can play uh, can play in terms of uh, in terms of improving or providing alternatives or build on traditional paradigms to develop uh, novel turbulent combustion models, and then I will illustrate the idea of data based frameworks 
because essentially what we have here is a framework for which you can actually put in different models. So, so I'm using the word framework here, and then within that, you can actually have models. And the illustration will be done using data from DNS, and I'm calling it poor man's DNS. Now people are doing, you know, scale and things like that and moving toward exascale, but you know, not everybody can afford to do that. What if you have only, you know, a cluster of, you know, of hundred, you know, uh, CPUs or something, then, then what can you do? Uh, the other aspect is, is, is multi-scale measurements, you know, and these measurements have been, have played a central role in, improve, uh, in improving models. Uh, and, and, and essentially all the work is done toward the validation. But you can actually, and also data discovery, but you can also do, you can use the data to develop models. And that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Then the same premise of these approaches can be extended to other applications. What if we actually want to run a hybrid simulation where the driving simulation is, let's say, a PDF-like model, like PDF transport or LES OVT or LEM LES or something like that. And then from the data generating these simulations, you can construct lower dimensional manifolds and run a flame lake approach, basically running on moments of transport of moments, and then run them in parallel. What kind of ideas can be transferred beyond, beyond what we have done already with DNS and multiscale measurement uh, based data? And then I'll conclude with thoughts because I think the idea is not, uh, is not to kind of describe this, but to kind of at least identify where are certain expansions uh, of this work can go. And it's kind of opening up a whole world if you are convinced that that makes sense, uh, then, then let's, let's see, these are what the thoughts are supposed to, to address. So motivation, let's start with complications and hopefully we'll, we'll try to get to something, some resolution beyond these complications. And the idea here is that even if you, can get, you are in gas phase, even if you are in gas phase, Combustion, turbulent combustion is complicated. I think everybody agrees with that. Everybody who signed on onto this probably knows that. Okay, so, so I will just spell it out in a sense that you know this is a, a basically a, an indication of the length and time scales associated with combustion processes. Okay, so you have you have maybe a continuum regime limit here. You may have some processes that occur and, and well-defined and so subcontinuum, you may have things that are that you can actually resolve in the DNS if you want to, and that can correspond to what happens in the combustion process, the flame, uh, turbulence scales, and also device scales. Device scales will also you know, impact whether you have heat transfer, whether you have flame impingement on a wall and things like that, unburned hydrocarbons and things like that. And, and what you really kind of have to worry about, and this is something that has been worked out over the years and over decades since, since people started to think about how to model turbulent combustion, is to, to identify the coupling. Okay, so you have a multi scale, multi physics, multi scalar, multi scalar, because you can have a problem here in which you have 10, tens of species. You can have a problem here in which you have thousands of species. Okay. And, and they're all coupled even within a flame structure. So you, you sort of have to look at what is the nature of the coupling? Is it scale coupling when they actually have common scales or physical coupling, okay? And, and is the coupling uh, basically two-way coupling? Uh, do you have a bottleneck that defines, you know, what, what, it, what drives the next processes? Understanding that physics, understanding what the nature of the coupling is, is really the key toward all the you kind know, of the traditional paradigms of turbulent combustion. Okay, so you know, kind of spell it out a little bit more. So you have, for example, the divide and conquer strategies. This applies essentially when you have a physical coupling, but essentially scale separation. You know, like a flame that approach, um, or what mixes burns kind of the approaches. You know, the EDC kind of approaches. Uh, in this case, uh, you do have physical coupling, you know, you can't kind of deny it, but the scale coupling allows you to kind of at least, you know, try to investigate different scenarios separately and then try to figure out how you can couple them. Different scenarios for flames being subject to different uh, unsteady strain rates, different curvatures, different things like that. And then you have to worry about turbulence and what other scales that say, for example, are responsible for wrinkling flame versus the ones that are, can change the transport within the reaction zone and so on. So uh, model physics separately, 
that's the strategy, I guess. And then try to figure out how you can couple depending upon what the complexity of that coupling is. If there's a bottleneck, for example, what mixes burns, then worry about you know, how you model the mixing. You have the easy problems, easy in codes, of course, is you know, problems in which you may have one-way coupling, okay? And you have scale separation. And, and that is, doesn't apply to soot, of course. It applies, for example, to NOx, uh, thermal NOx chemistry. That can be done almost as a post-processing process. But you, know, you may have situations where, for example, you may have separation scales, soot is sitting somewhere in subcontinuum, and, and the flame is sitting there. But you know, where the soot is being oxidized, where the soot is formed, determines how much radiation is coming from it. And that feeds back into the flame structure as well. So that's a two-way coupling, OK? Uh, the, but you know, the common problems, the most common problems that we deal with are essentially the ones that are physics and scale coupled, OK? And this is where all the headache comes from. And if you actually are moving towards situations where you may have uh, so lower quality fuels or fuels that have lower flame speeds or, or ultra lean combustion or things in which, for example, you have secondary air and things like that, you have multiple streams and things like that, you, it gets kind of complicated and the coupling gets complex. And that's where actually the dilemma is, okay? And, and, and yeah, there are strategies. If you can you know, isolate pairs, you, know, you can say turbulence in chemistry or radiations and turbulence or things, you know, kind of try to isolate effects and try to couple them together instead of having to deal with the whole mess. So there are openings, there are things which you actually know that are very helpful. First of all is, Working in thermochemical state space, not in physical space, not in X and T, but essentially in relating different species and different temperatures and different scalars, is your friend. Okay, uh, you can you can we can draw a lot of conclusions, important conclusions, when you actually work in physical space, and that has been a strategy in many many, especially the flame net like kind of approaches, you know, flame net and CMC and so on, is that you know if you work in composition space, you can actually gain a lot of physics. And there are gifts that nature has to give you there. First of all, uh, you have the idea of the potential that you can actually reduce dimensions, reduce the complexity of what is representative of that physical space, of that uh, composition space. So you may have here the big circle here, all the species, tens to thousands of species. Then you can, you can say, well, essentially, you don't actually need all that information because in a given problem, you have all these inherent correlations. You know, you know when the reactants are there, you know where the products are there, you know where all the reaction, uh, all the products are there, you know where the reaction is and what is being produced. A lot of the scalars are actually correlated. And if, if the more you narrow the problem, the more correlation you're gonna see. So the idea of representative scalars can actually reduce the complexity. If you don't have representative scalars, you can't even do any chemistry reduction. You can't even generate a skeletal mechanism, but you can actually even go beyond that in, this, in an even more aggressive way in turbulent combustion and say, I'm gonna focus basically on the major species and temperature. These are the slow manifolds you know, that people identify in many ways. Everything else is kind of fast. Um, it's a kind of a done deal. You, everything depends upon the slow manifolds uh, and, and primarily. But you can also do a further reduction if you know exactly what the problem is. Let's say you have a non-premix flame, the extent of mixing is important, okay? If you have a premix flame, we know what is a, a monotonic function that evolves from reactants to products, a progress variable. And, and so in many ways, the idea of further, more aggressive reduction using those low, low dimensional moments has been a hallmark of what, what, uh, what has driven a lot of the turbulent combustion models. The big picture, in a sense, thermochemical space can be reduced to representative scalars. And the nice thing about this representative scalars, by the way, is that you can actually, a lot of the measurements that are done, say in the Sandia flames and Sydney flames and, and the Cambridge flames and Darmstadt flames and all that, they really are, are targeting those major species. So you can actually get something out of, of, that, out of that data beyond just validation. So a, a, a general approach, and it's a very convenient approach when you try to address uh, closure in turbulent combustion is to kind of split the problem uh, as, you know, if you try to say, for, determine, say the mean, the unconditional mean, which is a closure, an important closure term for any of the species or maybe heat release rate. 
you can express it as a convolution. And the convolution contains a, you know, what you may define as a conditional mean, state space information, and one that basically describes statistics, the joint PDF. If you drive your problem into very low dimensional manifolds, then your PDF is gonna be lower dimensional. It's, it's less of a mess than actually having to deal with the joint PDF that is multidimensional. You have to have a lot of data and, and, and a lot of data and to reconstruct it is not a trivial thing. So, but, but this, this, this split has served combustion very well, turbulent combustion closure very well, okay? And so you have these two contributions, it's conditional, and then you have the one that basically describes, you know, the statistics at a given point, at a given position. In flame lit lake models, you know, whether you're dealing with uh, flame lit generated manifolds or flame lit uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, CMC and other approaches, you basically are constructing, you can construct uh, the conditional means using lower dimensional reactor models. For example, flame lit, you may use steady flame lits or maybe unsteady flame lits or maybe flame lits that allow, may allow for extinction and so on. But, uh, you know, these models are essentially deterministic that they don't generate statistics. They don't generate PDFs. So you stuck with having to deal with this, this PDF and the general kind of approach is to use a presumed shape. Okay, you have to assume a shape you hope for that, that what you hope for is that your dimension is, so, is not that complex that at least you can sort out what you wanna do with that uh, PDF if it happens to be two dimensional. Do you have to assume that you have statistical dependence or independence and so on? So this is the problem, for example, that you know, the, the flame net models have, been, have not been able to fully resolve reasonably well. There's a lot of flexibility in this and, and, and there are plenty of ideas out there. PDF-like models, including transported PDF, uh, the linear eddy model, LES approach, the LES one-dimensional turbulence uh, coupling, they can compute all these quantities directly, okay? You can actually compute means directly, but, but still generating a convolution will actually give you better strategies to, to compute these things separately. The conditional means based on all the data versus a distribution based on a specific position in space. So what can, they, what, what can data do for us? Uh, the traditional models, you can think of them going back all the way to the mid 1950s or so, uh, until we have all these different variants of models and modeling approaches. Uh, there's a rapid growth in how we generate data. Okay, there used to be time when DNS was 2D with a small few hundred you know, uh, grids in one direction or something. Now we're doing 3D DNS with almost you know, scale that is laboratory flame scale. So there has been improvement and significant enhancement of, of data. Uh, the capability of using multi-scalar measurements are impressive uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, line and, 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 and point measurements especially. And, and you can see how, how that role has been, has, has been basically decisive in improving, for example, uh, non-premixed combustion models. Uh, DNS is increasingly affordable. Uh, LES is slowly replacing RANs in many applications. Okay. So, and then we have this whole field that is basically exploding around us, which is basically related to data science and the application of machine learning that basically takes data and tries to figure out how to extract useful information for it, how to classify data, how to uh, provide um, uh, regressions, uh, you know, how to uh, transfer learning. You have data, can you transfer that information and extend it to conditions that are not seen? So all that, all that information, all these tools can actually be extended to apply to combustion. So you've seen already, I mean, model dimensionality reduction has been there for some time. Uh, the recovery from resolved scale, uh, subscale physics is also, I think, a, a novel kind of approach that you've seen uh, already, um, including the, you know, the, the modeling of, say, subgrid scale uh, fluxes, for example, for species and things like that. You can use you know, machine learning to discover what combustion mode you are, you're in, what combustion regime you're in. You can use, um, you can use machine learning to basically uh, merge two solution schemes, you know, hybrid multi-fidelity schemes by deciding uh, whether, whether it's time for you to use the highly resolved and high fidelity versus the one that is basically a flame-like approach. And there are additional opportunities, basically 
Because we normally, what we do is when we do validation, we only take one source of data and compare it. We don't try to see if we can pull data from different sources and see if they can all together try to help me improve the performance of a model. So let me, let me kind of go and kind of discuss two illustrations of database frameworks. And one of them is I'm calling it Puma and DNS. And the other one is the experiment-based uh, uh, DNS, okay? Uh, uh, not DNS, uh, uh, basically this one is experiment-based modeling and it targets LES and, and RAMs. So let's talk about Puma and DNS. So this is basically what we'd like to do is run a DNS on as big problem as possible, but we can't afford to do that. And even the ones that can afford to do that, they would like to run a bigger problem, right? So we're always looking for the bigger problem. And, 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 and so the strategy is the following. Uh, you, you run a small DNS. I mean, you can even make it low dimensional. We're not worried about the turbulence chemistry interactions. We're interested in the different scenarios that are being generated by DNS. You know, the range of curvatures, the range of uh, the range of strain rates and things like that, that will be necessary to capture that state space, okay? We're separating the problem again, state space and statistics because it's very convenient. It's very convenient to do that. Then what we do is basically try to do, generate a low dimension manifold of this data. Again, on state space, low dimension manifolds are on state space. And, and we use principal component analysis. There are other methods. It's very convenient and I'll tell you and, and I'll argue why PCA is important. And then what we do is the principal components, so we rotate our scalars to a basis and the leading components of that basis represent a big chunk of the variance of the data. So we can reduce, okay? So when you rotate into a basis and, and, and get, get, uh, get the leading principal components, make it up 99 point something percent of the, uh, of the variance of the data, then we keep those. So you end up you know, reducing from say 30 species to two principal components, 100 species, four principal components and so on. So that's the whole idea, okay? And, and, then, and then just because you have a linear transformation, the governing equations for principal components are also very similar to the governing equations for, uh, for say species and things like that. So, so you, you're using the same code you can actually do, you, you can do principal component transport. We use artificial neural network to, to develop models for reaction rates of principal components and their transport properties, let's say diffusion point, the diffusion properties. And then once we have the closure model for all the transport quantities for the principal components, we run a 3D DNS with principal components. And then while we have as a rule, we can actually recover our species and temperature and everything at any given time of the evolution of the principal components. It's as if we actually ran a 3D DNS with, with thermochemical scalars. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with ANN, uh, this is just a very basic multi-layer perceptron kind of structure. Uh, I know many of you actually do, and, and this probably may not, not be necessary, but just to kind of get everybody on the same kind of page, what an ANN does it basically has an input, you know, what you put in as, and this is where you're training, you, you, you have data that basically has an input, and then you have an output, which is what you're trying to predict. That could be a reaction rate, can be diffusion coefficient, uh, that can be, you know, there can be uh, any quantities that you're trying to get. And essentially the idea is that if you know this through a series of complex functions, not complex in the, in, in the mathematical sense, but through a series of functions, you can recover what you would like to get, okay? And, and essentially this is done through an input layer, how many inputs, and then a bunch of hidden layers. And the complexity of this architecture uh, dictates you know, what, you know, what the capability is in terms of predicting the output. Every one of these inputs has, has a neuron associated with it, the value, and the outputs also has neurons associated with the values. And then the hidden layers also have values. So when you see here, like one hidden layer, 
one, 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 one here is the number of hidden layer, and then the one, two, and three, and four is the order of the neuron in that hidden layer. And then what you do, for example, is if I want to determine the value of B11, I look at what the layer that is ahead of it, and then try to build its value by using the weights, the strength of the connections of these arrows, and, and, uh, and it, an activation function. And that's how it's done here. So B11, for example, depends upon the strength of the connection between B11 and the input one and the input two. This is represented here as a sum. There's something called a bias thing that I, I did not include it, but this is a sum, so it actually carries a contribution of the two input, the two layers that I had, uh, the, the layer neurons that I had of it. And then you implement an activation function, okay? That activation function can be, uh, you know, a sigmoid or something that basically will, will create the, uh, the nonlinearity in the solution. And, and then if you make it more complex, all you're doing is every neuron will have to look at the layer ahead of it and then build its value based on a weighted sum of uh, it's, it's the, the neurons ahead of it, and then you apply an activation function. Okay, so that's what I, and it's very powerful. You can use it for classification. You can tell it, you know, not just regression, you can tell it, you know, whether, uh, you know, for example, you have a premix or non premix flame, for example, in a, uh, you know, a classifying, um, you know, com uh, combustion modes and things like that. So things like that. Okay. Just an introduction. And because we're going to see slightly different, you know, neural networks that maybe we may be using in this, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, seminar. So, what is principal component analysis? What you do is you have your thermochemical scalars, that's your theta. It's got temperature and, 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 and species and everything. In fact, as I said, you know, I don't have to include all my, my thermochemical scalars. I'm gonna use the representative scalars. That will actually you know, make, make my, my PCA much, much easier. And then what you do is you construct a covariance matrix of these scalars and then do an eigenvalue decomposition and then end up with a linear Basically, this is a vector of principal components. This is the vector of normalized because you'd like, you don't want temperature and OH to compete for magnitude. So you normalize everything to be running from minus one and one or zero and one or something like that. And then, and then you get here a matrix of eigenvectors. And then you order them based on importance, meaning the first principal component will, and the first eigenvector makes up, let's say, 95% of the data variance. You add another 5% or 4%, that's a second principal component and so on, until, and, and then you go and decrease in kind of order. And then you truncate. So you get here, you end up with a lower number of principal components, NPC, instead of the total number of representative scalars. And that matrix now is no longer a square matrix, it's a rectangular matrix. And then what you do is if you want to actually recover uh, if you know the principal components, instead of having to invert this matrix, uh, you actually use uh, artificial neural networks to recover that uh, non-linearly that, that information. So you take your scalars, you carry out PCA, you generate NPCs, uh, using the cumulative variance, you retain a number of PCs, and then you try to recover, okay? So there's a nice here, there's a very nice uh, uh, a priori kind of testing for this approach because if you go through this route and then you try to recover your, your original data and then you lose, you don't predict that original data, then you're not retaining uh, enough PCs, principal components. So that's, that's very critical, okay? And this is an exam example of, of the data variance, for example, and this is, I think, based on the same data planes. The first PC takes up about 70 something percent of the variance. You add another PC, you get up to, you know, more than 90, you know, 90, close to 94. You take a third PC and then you're getting to 99%. And then you declare victory. You say, okay, three, three PCs are good enough for describing the data. But the beautiful thing about this is that, you know, just because of this, non, of this linearity, you can actually write transport equations for the principal components. Okay. So the source term would be linear in terms of the source terms of the representative scalars. And, and we have derived also expressions for the diffusion coefficients as well. And then of course you can, you can filter, you can average these equations so you can get them into a form that is RANS or LES. So why principal components? I mean, it's good, it's good enough for what we wanna do, it's optimal. You know, it's trying to get the uh, basis in which, you know, you have 
The first leading PC is taking up most of the variance. Generic, it does not require a priori what you're gonna choose as your, your low dimensional manifold. You don't have to say it's mixture fraction. If you have multiple stream mixing, you're gonna have to just define different mixture fractions and progress variables and things like that. The, the data tells you what it is, okay? Uh, it's a linear transformation. PC transport equations are ready. Uh, some will say, well, linear, and why is it linear? Combustion is not linear and all that stuff. Look, first of all, uh, if, if we can generate a mapping from thermochemical scalars to principal components, and then recover the thermochemical scalars from the principal components, I think that kind of does, that's, that's sufficient for our own purposes to, to consider that a useful method. Using nonlinear principal components will buy you, will may reduce uh, the number of required PCs, but it also buys you a lot of extra work. And you know, at the end of the day, also, you know, traditional parameters, if you look at the mixture fraction, the progress variable, and all that, just look at them. They, they're going to be linear combinations of, of thermochemical scalars. So, so we have tradition of using linear. And when you use linear, you can also have uh, make the principal components inter physically interpretable meaning you can actually see what's contributing to these uh, principal components. Now, if we, we extend that to experimental data, then, then actually there's, there are some features of, of PSP uh, principal components that are useful. Uh, the denoising, uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, uncertainty is spread over all the PCs, but if you actually retain uh, by the variance, the information is retained in the leading PC. Meaning if you, if you retain two leading PCs, you're taken off, you're taken off you know, out of eight, you may be actually taking off about 80% of the, uh, of the ex experimental uncertainty as well. Uh, PCA is a statistical tool, meaning you, you, you're not basing it on, on individual data, you're basing it on the bulk of data. You're doing a covariance matrix. So it is less sensitive to individual experimental measurements. And there are other methods, but you know, again, if you wanna do principal component transport, you'd like to have the same principal components in the entire domain. So local PCA may not help you. Uh, if you wanna do non-linear PCA, you end up with an extra term in the government equation that you have to sort out uh, if you wanna solve it that way. And I don't know if it's buying you anything because you're dealing with an additional closure term. As I said, you can do this a priori. I assume the questions in the chat So I can, I can answer these questions, I think, at the, toward the end, if possible. Um, so, uh, so this is an example in which we have an ethanol data that was provided by Dr. Chen at San Diego. And it's methanol. So it's based on a mechanism that has 29, uh, 28 species in temperature. And basically, these are slices of a problem in which they tried to study uh, Saki um, uh, spark-assisted compression ignition. And so this is a problem in which you actually are evolving from uh, essentially non-homogeneous ignition to a situation where you actually have flame kernels expanding and, and merging. And, and so it's a complex problem. And uh, this is an a priori meaning we actually take data, we run PCA on it, and then, and then try to recover the data using ANN and compare the two. The retained, uh, the retained species for principal component analysis include this, temperature, uh, the major species, and the fuel. They don't include HO2 and, H, uh, you know, and, and all that. They don't include H2. But you can see even data that is not part of the PCA can actually reasonably recover, recovered. The requirements, of course, of principal component transport is a little bit higher because now you're advancing your solution in time and, and you're also coupling space with diffusion. Uh, but this is... But, you, but the a PCA or uh, DNS, a PCA transport at least allows you to kind of gauge whether a, a number of principal components is enough or not. This is an illustration of an actual principal component transport. This is basically you solving principal component equations, governing equations. And uh, this is for a methane uh, 2D problem, uh, air flame, and using 30 species and, and temperature and 184 reactions. And we retain here the major species, but also we retain one radical. The radical here is important to capture curvature effects because you, know, you have 
when you have curvature, you have hydrogen and, and, and so on, and hi hydrogen atom and hydrogen molecule, you're going to have differential diffusion effects, and they're going to show up in, in the curved, highly curved regions. So we retain these as a marker, as a placeholder for, for the species that actually are responding to curvature effects. Out of this 30 species and temperature, 31 scalars, we retain these representative scalars, and then we carry out PCA, and then we out of that, so we have eight potential PCs, out of that we retain four PCs. And then, so, so we have a reduction here in the number of PCs, uh, uh, transported uh, scalars, but just because also we have eliminated some of the rapid species, um, you know, the rapid reaction species, you know, think of like CA2, CH2 star and things like that, you can actually advance at the larger time step. You can also, if you eliminate, eliminate some of the thin reaction zones, you can also coarsen the grid. So all these savings in terms of 10 times temporal resolution saving and four times spatial resolution saving is part of what you do when you actually generate PC transport. Okay. And, and you can see here, you know, this is a comparison of one of the species considered as part of the set. And the agreement, this is a cut along 1D direction. And, and this is a comparison of what the full DNS generated and what the principal component has generated. Okay, from an initial solution, which you actually had a flat flame and evolve it to account for turbulence and strain. And this kind of shows the error and the scales of the error, of course, are different from the scales of the actual solution. But you can also see the comparison here and it's, it's remarkable, the comparison here with this much saving. You could do the same thing even for quantities that are not even part of the PCA transport because you have all these columns of solutions, you have the PC columns, and then you can actually correlate the species that are generated in the DNS solution, the thermochemical scalar solutions with the PCs, and then you can recover them as well. So this, is, this solution, although you're running four PCs, you can recover all of your thermochemical scalars, all your species and all your temperatures. And the comparison here is remarkable as well. So we figured, you know, with this is the work of uh, Ope Oyeli, uh, uh, we basically figured, okay, let's just run a 3D DNS because you can afford to do that um, based on the data trained for, um, for the 2D DNS. The cost is essentially almost the same between a 3D DNS or PC transport and the 2D DNS with thermochemical scalar transport. That's what I mean by poor man's uh, approach. So, if, 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 if you are able to expand in a direction or in size and scale because of using PC transport, that's, that's a benefit to us in many ways because we isolated the thermochemical uh, state space uh, information and then we only ran the problem to account for the turbulence and the statistics. But what can you do also when you have experiments? You're gonna be the same uh, more or less except except that experiments are partial, they don't give you everything and they can be noisy. Ah, that's, that can be a problem, okay? Noisy, and, and we're not saying, I mean, 2% is actually remarkable or 3% is actually remarkable, but a two or 3% can translate into a very, very large uh, um, uh, error in say determining reaction rates and things like that. So, so that's, that's what the dilemma is. You know, small uncertainty can, can be get larger uncertainty in other quantities. But there is an opportunity and, and it's worth exploring. So this is something that Rishikesh Rinaldi, uh, my, um, my previous student actually did. And, and really the idea was, let's just try it. Let's just try to see if we can construct models out of the data, okay? And of course we had two, two options, uh, two general kind of you know, paradigms of two and do these things. The flame at like, you solve it for moments, or the PDF like, in which you try to resolve uh, you know, uh, all the uh, enclosed physics, the essential enclosed physics, the, the source term especially. We are, uh, we're adopting option one for a simple reason that you know, it's actually much more easier to implement it with um, when you have multi-scale measurements. They're not necessarily 1D or 2D, they can be basically multiple shot measurements and, and, and they provide you know, sort of single point kind of information, or it could be line information sometimes as well. So the idea here is to use again principal components. It seems to work. We'll extend it there, and and the principal components are the low dimensional moments. So instead of mixture fraction and a progress variable or something like that, we use principal components. 
And, and, and the measured species are really representative scalars. So let's do PCA on, that, on those measured quantities. The problem is if you wanna get any closure, you need to have source terms and chemical source terms means you have to have a, mecha a chemical mechanism. To have a chemical mechanism, you have to have the species that are in the mechanism. Well, yes, measured species are great for doing things, but you need to have the missing species as well. So we need to recover them. And that's probably the biggest challenge. So this is a governing equation. You got your momentum equation. You can use a, a, a species, a, a, a continuity equation if you have compressible or some sort of some sort, or you can use, uh, or you can use the actual model to, to solve for uh, the framework, the database framework to solve for the density. And then you essentially have a similar form of equation that you are familiar with as far as reactive scalars are concerned. The red terms here are the ones that you need to close. You need to model. Uh, and, 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 you know, the blue term here, the turbulent, you know, uh, viscosity or, or kinematic viscosity is something that you can actually incorporate as part of what we normally do in turbulent combustion closure. But you need the unconditional mean for the source term, for, for the principal components, and you need the density, okay? And again, the, the unconditional mean can be constructed by having the conditional means and the PDF, okay? The data provides a PDF. So this is like similar to a stochastic, uh, a stochastic reactor model. So we need to construct PCs. The data will give us that. Uh, we need to determine the joint PDF. The data will give us that. And we're gonna be using uh, a, something called uh, the kernel density estimation. We need to uh, close this term, which means you also have to determine the conditional means for the source terms, but you also have to recover this. You have to recover source terms for the PCs. And those source terms are linearly related to, to species source terms, but we don't have the species source terms, so we have to recover that. And this is done using the pairwise uh, mixing stochastic reactor model by Pope. So again, you have data at a given position. You can, you can fit and KDE uh, through it. It's just a standard, you know, it will allow you to generate any shape function for that matter. And, and that's very convenient. It also generates a smooth function, okay? Uh, so, so that's where we, we, you know, the use of KDE is, is important. Uh, later on, I'll talk briefly about, you know, generalizing the KDE for every position of the computational domain by incorporating the unconditional means of the PCs as, 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 uh, as additional parameters. And then we rely on the depot net for that. Uh, to recover and, and uh, uh, basically unmeasured species, the way uh, we've done it, is, is to partition the PC space into like or similar um, data, say similar vectors. So the solutions are very similar because we're trying to do local mixing here. And the local mixing allows to basically kind of clean up and denoise the major species. But at the same time, if you run for a short time, you can actually cover uh, the minor species as well. So that's the whole idea. So, so we basically uh, run a self-organizing map. It's a clustering algorithm to kind of put together data. Uh, so the whole entire data can be placed together as, as, as like data and then uh, run the PMSR for the different data points here. And then that way we can actually reconstruct. So you basically have mixing and reaction going on at the same time for a short period of time. And, and this is a comparison, you can't do this with, with data. So we actually used uh, the one dimensional turbulent simulation of, of the Sandia flames to kind of test it. And it looks like it's, it can actually work really well. And of course the ultimate test is when you, when you implement it in the model. So PMSR, you partition the data like uh, uh, composition space uh, information into clusters. And then for each cluster, you run a PMSR the difference between this PMSR and the traditional kind of PMSR is that we don't really require an input or an output. We put the data together and then we mix them and react them together, okay, for a short period of time. And, and, and then we end up regenerating missing species, you know, the, all the radical species and everything that is missing in a chemical mechanism, okay? So if you have a nicer, smaller chemical mechanism, you don't have to recover a lot. If you have a more extended chemical mechanism, you're gonna have to recover all the species in it. So this is the general approach. It's kind of messy and this is gonna give you the big picture. You start with data, that's the bottom, top here. And then basically what you do is you do the principal component analysis. That's the low dimensional manifold. You construct the PDF 
you try to recover on this track the missing species, and then eventually the model will deliver to you will deliver to you a closure model uh, for the density closure model for if you want to recover the species. You don't need them for the simulation, but you want to recover uh, unconditional means for say certain species. You can do that, and this is also needed in the model, which is the uh, the unconditional mean for the uh, for the principal component source terms. Okay. And, and this is an illustration for the case of the Sandia flames. You could see you could see what's going on here. You essentially have uh, uh, three PCs will make up. This is the total of contribution to the data variance. So 100% means you're covering everything in the data. Three PCs will actually get you to 99% of the data variance. For RANS simulations, that's that's perfect. For DNS, you may like to push it to 99.9% .9 or something. Uh, but for, for RANS purposes and LES purposes, 99% you declare victory. Okay. So these are the same DF flames, different Reynolds numbers. Uh, the measured quantities are these, uh, major species plus a radical. And of course, you have all the richness of the data and there, you know, non equilibrium effects, extinction, emission, um, and so on. And as I said, you know, 99% is captured with 3PCs. So we're running 3PCs. Uh, the PCs are interpretable physically. You can actually tell what's contributing to these PCs. The first PC is that column. Uh, is, is this, these are the coefficients that represent the contributions to this, this column components. And you can see, for example, that uh, the first PC uh, may be represented by essentially by temperature and O2 and, and basically the, the reactants uh, and, and the products. Uh, and, and then, so things that are basically measuring progress of reaction. And then, and then the second PC is, is represented by C, methane, CO, and hydrogen, and O2. And, and you can see here by plotting it in terms of the mixture fraction, the second PC looks very similar to a mixture fraction. The first PC looks very similar to a progress variable. And then you get all these variations that's happening once you go beyond the two PCs, okay? The ones that we normally are not, we're not comfortable covering by just ad hoc approaches, but the PC transport will allow you to do that. Comparisons are at different downstream distances where you get extinction, where you're getting reignition. Uh, you know, for mean and RMS dash ones, uh, for different flames, flame D, ENF, the comparison is, is, uh, is, is very good. Okay. This is based on principal component transport, meaning you're solving for the average equations for the principal components in RANS. Okay. You can see the comparisons are, are, are reasonable. Uh, we also tested this problem for uh, the, the Sydney flames. The Sydney flames, of course, have the interesting kind of uh, complications in the sense that you, by allowing the, the fuel uh, inlet to, to move down the, the tube around the air, you can allow for more mixing if you push the, the, fuel, uh, the fuel inlet uh, down or less mixing between those two streams if you push the fuel inlet up, okay? And, and therefore you have here, for example, a nearly homogeneous condition versus a non-homogeneous conditions and so on. So th there are variations in this, okay? And, and that adds up, uh, again, uh, additional combustion modes, especially in a nearly homogeneous condition, because now you can actually have premixed combustion going on right at the inlet, and then further downstream, you're switching to non-premixed combustion. And the nice thing about this, of course, you know, it's not easy to define a unique mixture fraction for this variable that can track that. But, but the PCs are morphing to actually respond to these differences. And that's really the advantages of PCA. So you can see here the comparison of the inhomogeneous flame. This, this is a really heavy kind of uh, slide. So that's why the cursor is not moving as fast. But essentially, you have the inhomogeneous, the top row, and the homogeneous case. And uh, you're plotting things, for example, the PC1 and the PC2, the first principal components, as a function of the mixture fraction. What you could see here at, at different uh, X over Ds, uh, near the inlet, X over D equal to one, and, and further downstream where you begin to actually recover a non-premix combustion mode. What you could see here that the behavior is very similar farther downstream, you're recovering a non-premix mode, but when you are uh, at X over D equal to one, the pilot, and what is going on in terms of the combustion is governing a lot of things. So you can have 
for example, the pilot playing a critical role in that premix mode to define, uh, and, 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 and of course the combustion between the fuel and the air, uh, you have a whole range of conditions that, that can occur um, when you have a pilot, uh, when you have a homogeneous case versus a non-homogeneous case. Okay, and the principal components are responding to that. And the principal components used all over the entire domain are the same, but they're responding to these differences and, and conditions. And of course, I, I'm not gonna bother with comparisons, but I think they're reasonable in many ways that they're comparable or even sometimes better. Uh, and, and it's more comprehensive in the sense that we actually considered these three flames and additional flame that's not shown here. And the agreement is, is, uh, is, is reasonable. Another interesting kind of observation here by looking at the correlations, especially when you look at the candle and spearmint correlations that tend to be more uh, indicative of statistical independence. We see that, you know, when we have conditions near the reaction zone, you actually have correlations that tend to be close to zero. So there's an indication that, that between the different principal components, we can actually generate statistical independence and assume, for example, that the, the joint PDF of the PCs is a product of the marginal PDFs of the individual PCs. Okay, uh, so that's that kind of uh, helps a lot in many ways uh, in, in, in justifying the use of principal component analysis. It's not just we're dealing with uncorrelated, there may be some degree of statistical independence that is useful there. Now, having talked about this, what can you do? Essentially, we have a framework, but we can actually modify aspects of this framework. And one example is what if we, uh, you know, this, uh, this idea of really trying to combine, for example, multi-fidelity approaches, or maybe have an adaptive, adaptive approach in which the, the model can, can, can conform to evolving conditions. And these are the ideas, for example, you see these references uh, by, uh, by uh, Dr. Muller's group, um, and Dr. Emmy's group um, as well. And, and the idea is what can we do if we can actually use a PDF-like model that generates data, PDF model generate data, and exploit the data on the fly to generate a lower dimensional flamelet-like approach based on PC transport, similar to what we have done with, with experimental data, and then, and then run that cheaper model and then every now and then you, you kind of turn on the, the PDF-like approach to generate more data and then allow the, the cheaper model to evolve, to evolve in, in terms of the PCs, to evolve in terms of the construction of the condition means, to evolve in terms of the construction of the PDF. And in many ways, if you can do that incrementally, uh, machine learning tools are very good for that because essentially if you only slightly modify the training data, you are slowly, you, you can guarantee that you can actually have a lower number of epochs uh, required for your solution to converge. So the idea is to transfer a lot of the information that is associated with the generation of conditional means, PDFs and everything into a machine uh, learning um, uh, set of tools. So for example, instead of principal component analysis, you can actually use what's called an auto encoder. An auto encoder basically tries to match uh, an input, the output with the input by running the information through a bottleneck, lower number of uh, uh, neurons to capture the essence of the data. And that's actually very useful in denoising as well, but it's also playing a role in, in, in basically reducing the complexity. The information in the neurons is essentially similar to principal components, except that you don't have the nice, you know, orthogonality conditions and things like that. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one tool. The other one, which is kind of interesting as well, is, is the ability to construct conditional means so you have here what you can do with the raw data. You can bend the data and generate means for each bin and generate conditional means, but you can actually generate that using an, an artificial neural network. You have your principal components. You match them with the, uh, the, uh, the data, the, the experimental data, and then use a neural network to, so you train it on experimental data. So the data has noise and, or, or you know, if you have experimental data or you have the, um, the data that you generate in the simulation. And then the neural network will generate conditional means. Okay, you train it on the data, but, but the output, the neural network is actually, if you give it a pair of principal components, it will give you the means. And this is an illustration of that. And it's actually even going beyond the access, uh, access uh, conditions, but it's actually, it actually looks like it's extrapolating as well. You don't need it, 
but it looks like it's, it's doing actually a decent job. Uh, the deep one is also another um, idea that I think that was uh, uh, put forward by Rishikesh and it's very, very useful in many aspects. It's the idea that, you know, we can train, we can fit PDFs at every given position, but what if we generate a general function that can, that basically is a PDF for every position, meaning you parameterize it in terms of the conditional means, okay? And this is what the deep net is supposed to do. You basically have data from different, uh, different parameters. You have the instantaneous species and then you have the average species, the different position information. And then each one of them has its own channel in which you're feeding information and you're trying to optimize using weights. And then you concatenate the information, you put them together. So they all optimize separately and then put together. And then you have an additional optimization kind of uh, uh, a set of layers, and then you get the output, okay? So it allows you to provide data that are basically different sources in a sense, or different uh, data that is an incompatible in principle because you have average and instantaneous and use it to generate a combined function that generate that is a function of the principal components instantaneous and also the unconditional means. Okay. And again, if you train the deep net incrementally, it's not going to be expensive because you're adding, let's say, you, you're basically throwing away 20, let's say 10% of the original data, you put back 10% of the original data, you're operating with an incremental set of data. So the weights have already not that far from where you, you started with. Uh, this is an illustration of the use of the, uh, the deep on uh, for the Sydney flames. And you can see here that you can actually capture different shapes with the, with the deep on compared to, you know, just a straight computation of fitting on the deep on using KDE. So this, this approach actually works. And the interesting thing is, is there's evidence that you can, that the deep on can actually extrapolate because it learns functions from functions. It learns operators from functions. It's not like a fitting in which you take values and fit a function. This one takes in functions and generate operators. So, so we tested it on the Sandia flames. Um, this is, we trained it on the Sandia flame E and we could see that it's predicting because it's trained for it. But then you try it on uh, the flame D for different positions and flame F and it's capturing a lot of the physics. It's capturing a lot of the PDF, okay? So, so there's an ability to kind of extrapolate uh, uh, the data if, if uh, you know, uh, a capability. It's not really generalizable, but, but it's, it's a capability to extrapolate the data. So uh, maybe I talked about so many things and I, maybe it's a good time to kind of, you know, uh, make some few conclusions. Uh, first of all, we have demonstrated the poor man's DNS based on PC transport. The more complex the chemistry is, the better uh, that approach is gonna be for that matter. Okay, you do not wanna run it on hydrogen. You wanna run it on a complex fuel, more complex fuel. Uh, and, and this can accelerate 3D DNS, can enable bigger problems. We also uh, have developed a physics grounded. You know, a lot of the arguments are based on paradigm, traditional paradigms of turbulent combustion, but it's based on experiments, okay? For modeling turbulent combustion. And, and it's a framework, meaning you can actually swap components to the model. You can, you can cluster terms differently. You can generate conditional means differently. You can generate PDFs differently uh, and, 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 and so on. You can add additional equations to the PC transport equations. If you think, for example, I'd like to model radiation differently. I'd like to do this differently, okay? Um, so it has checks and balances. That's important. You can actually test right the, net, the framework before you can actually run it in the, in the, with a PC transport. And the PCs are meaningful because you can actually relate it to what you started with. Um, the uh, PCA can be used for denoising essentially, but, but it's also useful. It, it can allow you to generate governing equations without really having to modify a code. Um, deep on that uh, is able to, uh, is able to, to actually, uh, to a certain extent, generalize the, the solution even on scene data. And that's very important. But in general, you know, machine learning approaches are designed for seen data and unseen data is not, is not a guaranteed thing to, to go with. Even if DeepOnet is able to kind of show you some of that, that, that. So I think the really interesting problems here are gonna be related to what is the next step is what do we do with data so that even if you have a certain limited amount of data, you can, you can use it to model 
slightly different data under different conditions. Let's say you have flame D and you're trying to generate flame F uh, statistics. Uh, you, you may have a configuration uh, in which you have low turbulence, you generally would like to generate higher turbulence. And this is, I think, think where I think some of the interesting questions occur, uh, occur. For example, can we spawn new data from existing data? We have done some of that when we actually did PMSR, right? We, we recovered species from, from clusters of data. But what if we actually use a stochastic reactor models on flame experimental data and run the stochastic model with a higher rate of mixing to generate what appears to be a higher rates of, of turbulence? And there are stochastic mixing models that can actually do that. For example, Kirstein's hierarchical uh, partial swapping approach. And this is work that we're doing right now. The other kind of you know, uh, question is, can we rely on multi-fidelity simulations? You know, why do we have to rely only on line measurements or point measurements? If you also have measurements, for example, on flame speed, uh, you know, people, for example, have ignition delay time versus temporal measurements for, for shock, shock tube measurements for chemistry. Can we actually kind of combine data as well to, to do that? Okay, uh, and, and, and that's, 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 that can be also very important. The other one is, you know, there are ideas of transfer learning in which you can generate data for a certain set of conditions, could be the same fuel, could be different fuels, and can be generalized. You know, sometimes you lump, you know, for example, chemistry in flame speed. We, we, we lump, you know, resistance times and flame thickness. Can we kind of abstract that information and, 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 and try to see if we can, we can extract more useful information if we have lots of DNS uh, uh, data from different sources? Maybe this is a good time to stop and, and I can open the, you know, the forum for questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop right now. And if you have okay, any questions, thank you. Yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Sharkey, and for your uh, nice talk. Uh, I think we, we do have some questions here and I just uh, uh, try to read them uh, according to the timeline, okay? So the first one actually from Umesh and he asked, uh, in the principle, in the PCA analysis using the 2D DNS, are the number of principal components the same through the whole flow field? Yes, yes, and, and it makes a lot of sense to do it like that, right? Because you, you not, if you have different uh, number of PCs, uh, what you end up with is kind of trying to, at the interface between those different zones, you, you have to kind of uh, try to figure out if you can convert everything to, to thermochemical scalars so that they can talk to each other. So communication gets complicated if you try to use different PCs or different number of PCs. So the, the same number of PCs is used throughout. Even if the problem allows you to use a lot lower number of PCs, for example, where there's no chemistry or there's nothing going on. Okay, so the next question from uh, Professor G and the uh, so do you need to update the transfer matrix in PCA locally as the reaction and the transport you all? Uh, update it in a simulation or update it in? Uh, in PCA, probably in, in the simulation. Right. So, yeah. So, so, well, the PCA is a pre-processing kind of step. So if you, if let's say you have data, uh, you, you know, like say experimental data, you do your PCA on all the data and, and do the reduction ahead of time. If you do a problem in an adaptive fashion, meaning you actually are discovering data as you evolve the problem. And that's like the last item I discussed about, you know, a couple of, you know, multi, multi-fidelity approaches, then the PCA is allowed to evolve. You know, you may choose to kind of say, I'm going to set, you know, a number, my number of PCs to be five. And, 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 and all I'm doing is, I still have number of, the same number of equations, but you know, where the contribution of different PCs, what that those PCs correspond to in terms of temperature and species is gonna be different, but I'm evolving those PCs that way. So th in that case, they can evolve. And this is where I suggested maybe using uh, autoencoders instead of doing the eigenvalue decomposition. Okay, so the next question is from Dr. Uh, Professor Gore. And uh, so he kind of asked, uh, have you addressed uh, transient events like ignition and extinction with this analysis? Uh, yes, we, we, you know, the, um, uh, in PC transport, we've done it. Um, 
just to give an example, the uh, the a priori that is uh, the Sandia flame is an actual transient problem. Okay, uh, meaning you start with no chemistry, nothing, an unhomogeneous mixture, and then you put a spark in it, you put a heat source in it, and then you allow the whole mixture to evolve. That's a condition where you actually take the data from, you know, in principle, if you track the data from initially to later on, and you do PCA on different data, you're going to get a different set of PCs. But the way we do it is we actually take the whole set of snapshots of all the evolution of the system and generate the same PC vector that is corresponds to the initial condition and the latest conditions as well. So that's a transient problem that, that, uh, that we've done. Uh, we've done something like that with using one dimensional turbulence, but not with DNS, uh, with PC transport. Okay, so next question also from Professor Gore. So he asked, uh, can DNS ever be a 2D problem? And uh, it's really not uh, essential for a simulation to be classified as DNS? Uh, it depends what you want to do. Uh, so, so the reason why I, I say 2D DNS is because 2D DNS is the minimum, minimum one that will actually give you curvature and straining in a multidimensional fashion, okay? Uh, it's not good for statistics. You can't say anything about turbulence when you have a 2D DNS and 2D turbulence is completely different from 3D turbulence. So, so the, way, the way you do it is you actually are looking at the composition space. The different scenarios encountered by flame under the effects of, of, uh, of curvature and strain. Then when you run your 3D DNS, the expense of the big data 3D DNS, you allow, for, you allow turbulence to, to do its thing. You allow the statistics to do its own thing. But in composition space, there's no significant difference. You can reproduce the same composition space with 2D DNS uh, and, and, uh, that you, you encounter in 3D DNS, okay? You, you, can, you, can generate, you can generate all the scenarios that you should expect in, in 3D DNS and 2D. But not statistics, composition space and info. Okay, I think there's, there's another question in the uh, Q&A. And uh, so, uh, anonymous. So it's like he said, uh, kind of, uh, I didn't quite understand the role of the AAN after you reduced the state space using PCA and solve the governing equations for the reduced state variables. Could you please revisit that? And Dr. Gore actually answered this question a little bit. And if you want to add something, you can. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not privy to Dr. Gore's answer, but I can tell you, I can tell you the reason why. So here's what you do. Let's say you start with eight, eight, uh, eight, uh, eight species. You reduce them to two. And you have this one-to-one -one conversion that is the matrix A. Now, when you got two, you lost information. You lost information, okay? Because there's still 1% or less you know, remaining in the other principal components. You can theoretically invert, do the left uh, inverse of that, uh, of that rectangle matrix and recover but it's not gonna be that good. Because what you're doing is, uh, you're doing ANN, where you basically have all these columns of information. You, you're trying to figure out what is the best way of recovering that, those species using ANN. You're creating a function and, and, and you're accounting for the, for the fact that you are not including everything that you should have kept in terms of the PCs. So if you do the inverse, you're not gonna get exactly, if, if you do the left inverse of the rectangle matrix, you're not gonna get exactly an accurate solution for uh, for the original principle for the original thermochemical scalars. If you do an ANN, you, you're doing a uh, regression. Yes, of course you're going to recover that. So every time okay, you lose information, it's not easy to recover it. That's the bottom line. Okay, thanks. There's another question. This is the last one from uh, the Q and A uh, from Shijie. So uh, first, uh, is, is thanks so much for your nice talk. And uh, two questions. First is, uh, is there any criteria for choosing bandwidth for KDE? And the second question is, will different selections of bandwidth matter a lot to the approximated kernel density function? So, so I, I kind of went through the kernel density estimation very quickly. Uh, it's a fitting function. Uh, basically what you do is you know you construct the PDF. You have at one point you have a bunch of data. Let's say six hundred uh, uh, multiple shot kind of data. So so this multiple shot uh, data has different values. 
And, and what the uh, KDE does, it kind of tries to fit a whole PDF using a combination of say Gaussian uh, functions. So it constructs a complex function using a sum of Gaussian functions or a sum of other you know, kernel um, functions. So, the, so I, I don't know where the boundary kind of comes in because essentially at that data point, you can, it, it's not aware of what's around it. It's a point measurement. So the PDF is a point information and it doesn't see anything but what is in that at that point, the sample, the sample of, of uh, shots that you have at that point. But I don't know if I understood completely whether that, that's referring to boundary condition or like you know the presence of walls or things like that or something else. So if if you know, I'll, I'll be happy to clarify it if uh, if, if I understand uh, if I answer the question or, or I do not answer the question, of course. Yeah, if you have further questions, you can send email to Dr. Shaki all the time. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's time for us to conclude the combustion webinar for this time. And thank you so much for Dr. Shaki to give us a nice talk. And also thank you all for your attendance and uh, have a good day. Have a